And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana University basketball news and discussion. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Podcast on the Brink is a joint production of the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. For complete coverage of IU basketball, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com. Hi fans, this is Don Fisher, the radio voice of the Indiana Hoosiers. IU football tickets are on sale now for the 2018 season. Indiana hosts seven home games this fall in newly expanded Memorial Stadium. Don't miss any of the action as the Hoosiers take on the Cardinals of Ball State, the Virginia Cavaliers, and five Big Ten opponents, including Michigan State, Iowa, Penn State, Maryland, and the Purdue Boilermakers. For ticket information, visit IUHoosiers.com today. Go IU! On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich and I are joined by one of our favorite recurring guests, John Gassaway, who covers college basketball for ESPN.com. And we talk with John about the RPI's death, which he is very excited about, and what the NCAA is replacing it with, the net rating system. What do we know about it? What do we not know about it? What are some things that have John excited about it? And what are some things that maybe he's worried about? Spend some time talking about that. Then we turn our attention to the Big Ten. How would John tier the Big Ten? Who are the contenders? Who are the teams that are pretty good and may compete for a postseason tournament slot? And then what does the rest of the conference look like? Why is he so impressed with Juwan Morgan? What does he expect from Romeo Langford? And then we end with an interesting discussion about his appreciation for Victor Oladipo's wonderful 2013 season. All of that and more on this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink. John, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, and I'm sure it's especially great right now because you are kind of basking in the afterglow of the RPI being eliminated. It is dead. Uh, The net rating system is here, which we don't know a lot about, but I think we all, uh, you know, kind of believe is going to be better than what we had. So I want to start things off this week talking about that. What elements of this change are you most excited about and which ones are you maybe approaching with a little bit of trepidation? I'm most excited about the fact that we're not talking about the RPI anymore. And uh, we've been doing that for the entirety of the time that I've been talking and writing about college basketball. So I, I don't want to be one of those people who's, you know, gets on a podcast and says, let's start ripping apart the net without first <laughs> stating that the RPI is really gone, uh, something that I was, uh, I and a lot of others was asking for for a long time happened. So, um, you know, I'm recording this uh, wearing a pointy hat and I'm, I'm still celebrating. And I just want to say thank you and well done, NCAA. And now here's everything you're doing wrong <laughs> since, <laughs> since last week. But uh, I, I did want to get that gracious note in first. So that's that's the uh, thing I'm most looking forward to is that uh, we've we have moved forward. And that is no small thing. And are there, are there any elements of the net, I mean, the way that it's been explained so far that you think are particularly smart in, in the way that they're setting that up? They've, uh, they've, the, the first point to be made about the net is that we don't know what it is. Um, it, it's an unusual situation where if you think about, um, if I was coming to you and I said, I want to write about, I, I want you guys to uh, let me write for you about Indiana basketball. And you would say, okay, great. Uh, and I said, I've got this great new rating system that I'm going to use that caps margin of victory at, at 10 points and it uses schedule strength. And um, that's all I can tell you. It's, it's based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, hire me. Uh, you would say, eh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Uh, but the NCAA is in the unique position of just being able to say, this is all we got and we can't show you anything more. So we don't really know what's in there except what they've told us about the the cap on margin of victory. And it's going to incorporate, apparently, a straight efficiency margin as opposed to one that's adjusted for strength of schedule. Uh, strength of schedule will be in there elsewhere. So, you know, these are uh, tentative uh, outreaches toward how we really do 
uh, rate teams in terms of their strength in 2018. So that's that's an objectively good thing. Uh, I am, however, concerned that in some ways maybe we've killed the RPI only to find that we're still uh, inhabiting bad habits uh, instilled in us by by years of using that schedule obsessed metric. And I don't mean just the NCAA or just the men's committee, but I mean all of us, <laughs> bracketologists, uh, people who talk about college basketball, all of us uh, speak of strength of schedule as though it were this separate uh, entity when in fact it should just be part of the adjustment that you make for any rating of a team. And, you know, you should have an end product that says, here's how the team is. And don't worry about, it. you know, schedule of strength, uh, strength of schedule is already in there. And uh, here's our nice number. But but we still insist on viewing it uh, separately as something that needs to be uh, mastered and managed by teams. And uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes in the first season of the net. But that could that could prove to be a nasty habit that the RPI is left behind. John, I have, uh, I don't know if it's two questions or two thoughts that I just want to get your reaction to on, on this whole system. And, and like you, I was happy to see the RPI go away. Um, but first, the lack of, I guess, transparency with sharing a formula or, or arriving at um, some kind of explanation of how this number is calculated. Do you have a problem with that? And also the timing of this to me seems a little bit weird because we have a situation where teams have made schedules for this upcoming season, right? Based on an old system um, on how they're going to uh, potentially calculate a resume or how they're going to look at uh, teams for the tournament. And now all of a sudden before this season, you're telling them they're gonna, that's changing and, teams have already made their non-conference schedule one do you have a problem with the lack of transparency at all or is that something you think in time we're going to learn more about and two is the timing of this uh am i maybe overreacting uh with my second point at all or do you think there's any uh validity to, uh, to that point well with the first point i would simply i mean it's uh, the NCAA's formula, and if they really are using uh, machine learning and, and forward thinking and all those buzzwords, then there's not a formula to show us per se, but they could describe the procedure. Uh, they want to hold on to that. You know, I mean, I, you know, part of me understands that. I, I don't share every trick in my bag either. That's fine. But what I do have to do is explain what I'm doing to my editors and and show you know what I'm trying to do uh, in terms of rating actual things. So I, I would I was very surprised that they wouldn't just say here are the net ratings as they would have looked uh, at sunset on Selection Sunday 2018. I mean that seems like the first obvious step for anything like this. Um, they could have gotten all of the, and they could have done that for the last several selection Sundays, get a lot of, uh, you know, what would probably be criticism, frankly, but they would get it all now in August. Uh, what's going to happen is that any rating system uh, can look weird with respect to a given team or two or 10 or 15, and that's going to be happening in real time during the season. Look, if we were all parked on KenPom.com, uh, and it was unveiled and we were told this is going to actually determine the teams, we would find a team or two uh, at this, you know, beloved, uh, venerable institution of Ken Palm even where we'd say, whoa, what's what's going on with this? That will happen with the NCAA. I would have loved to have seen what the net would have done with Xavier last year, for example, who won a ton of close games uh, against everybody in the world except uh, Providence and had, a, you know, won the Big East outright over the eventual national champion. Uh, what does your rate? That's a great example, the kind of which we get every year in college basketball. What, it's a tough case. What does your rating system do with Xavier 2018? This, this is the kind of thing I'm interested in. Um, but this is what they've chosen not to do, and we'll, we'll have to ride with it. And then your second point is well taken, and I would guess uh, a lot of coaches are stewing about that because it's been a, a reflex uh, long since learned to schedule to the RPI. Even if you're not forthrightly gaming the RPI, you're, you're scheduling with it in mind. And uh, the NCAA has taken 
the rug out from under those schedules. Uh, I would hardly be consistent if I said that's wrong of the NCA to junk the RPI. I, I think it's a step that they had to take at some time, but I, I understand the point about the, the schedules have already been formulated. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, non-conference scheduling, uh, I think it's already prominent enough and it's in importance. And uh, it will be interesting to see what happens when it's rated under a different lens entirely. Anyway, that's what's going to happen in 2019. John, you mentioned earlier, you know, that one of the things that we do know about the net is this margin of victory and how it's being capped at 10 points. Um, and you sent a tweet out a few days ago, you know, wondering if margin of loss is also floored at 10 points. Can you can you talk about the impact of putting, you know, kind of an artificial cap on margin of victory and why that might be a, a good thing or a bad thing ultimately for, for how the ratings come out? Um, they have said that they will cap margin of victory at 10 points and there will be another component in there. And again, this is all guesswork because we haven't seen it uh, in action. But if the bullet points that we've seen are correct, there will be another uh, component in the rating that's just straight efficiency rating, which is in effect your margin of victory for the entire year, and that will be uncapped. So a little bit of double measurement, uh, a little bit of uh, blending two things together that are highly similar. But to the extent that uh, margin of victory game by game is in here and it is capped at 10 points, uh, that will scrunch the entire field together, to use a highly technical term, and it will uh, mean that it's less dispersed than it would be naturally. Uh, I have some concerns about that. If you're if you're compacting the entire field, and we're so much in the habit, as we've done for decades now, of speaking of these things in terms of ordinal rankings and saying, well, Indiana is ranked number 25 at this. Uh, you know, numbers 24 and 26 will be effectively identical. And it might be better to get in the habit of saying, you know, Indiana got a, you know, 0. 0.57 or something. And then we're, we're really dealing with the qualities at hand here, um, especially when we use these artificial, uh, not artificial, but round number cutoffs as we're continuing to do with the new quadrant system. So, uh, you know, I understand what they're saying. I understand that nobody wants uh, people running up the score, but it's uh, it's tough when you say we're going to cap it. And uh, you know, one uh, one salute that I'll give to the NCA, and they they've done a good job at this recently as far as uh, rehearsing rule changes in the NIT, and they they've told me, and I believe in them that they will look at this cap. Maybe ten points isn't the best level. Maybe it should be higher, and they'll look at it and maybe change it after this coming season. But uh, we will have to see how it works. Hey, time to pay some bills real quick. So some of you are going to hear a few ads. Others of you will just go right back into our conversation with John Gassaway. We're going to turn our attention to the Big Ten and where John sees Indiana fitting into the hierarchy. That's coming next on Podcast on the Brink. Shifting gears from the net to uh, the Big Ten, and, and to me this is one of the most exciting times of the year. We were talking a little bit before we started recording that most people right now are looking forward to college football, but... I think the three of us in this conversation can all agree that we're looking forward to things like the Blue Ribbon yearbook coming out and the various <laughs> preseason projections, which I don't know if that makes us uh, weird or, or what, but hey. Or it's just normal August, Indiana, Illinois fans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but here we are in late August, and all I can think about is when the first college basketball preview guide is going to hit newsstands and I can dig in. But, but John, I want to ask you about the Big Ten this coming season. If you had to split the league – into tiers uh contenders maybe teams that are solid but won't uh, compete for the league crown and then the other teams and i'm not putting you on the spot because there's 14 teams but but how would you do that at this point in time yeah 14 teams and 20 conference games it's a it's a brave new world uh let's uh, let's take the easy part first and start from the bottom and, and work our way up uh, and let me let me throw a bouquet to the quote unquote bottom, because I, I think the Big Ten this year, maybe long term uh, is and it's tough for a 14 
team league to do this. But I think it's kind of uh, starting to resemble the Big 12 more and more where, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, things that I either write or more often tweet about every year is how cool it would be if every big 12 team got in the tournament, you know, <laughs> we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. It's, it's a lot easier with a 10 team league. Uh, and where I'm going with this is uh, the easy bet every year is like Rutgers will be uh, the team that I talk about first at the bottom. Uh, Rutgers after years of people saying Rutgers is better this year, uh, they kind of incrementally are every year and it's it's hard to notice because you're still effectively talking about teams at the bottom of the big 10 that really can't win consistently or, or win even sporadically on the road so visually it tends to look the same but in terms of what they can do within a, a population of division one teams uh, records really will be better and i i salute them uh, and I, I see them. Uh, this is this is uh, good news, bad news. I do see them, and perhaps uh, Minnesota is forming a, a two-team uh, third tier, where I, I don't think we'll be uh, necessarily talking about these teams in terms of postseason play. But uh, you know that used to be a much clearer cut and a much wider miss for the Big Ten than than what we might see this year. And then secondly, in terms of the mid-tier, that's that's by far the, the largest section of the Big Ten. And these, these will be teams that will uh, be in contention for some kind of uh, postseason. And at the top of this section, uh, they'll be in, very much in contention for NCAA uh, bids, but not looking at uh, particularly good seeds in the NCAA, perhaps, or expected to go terribly far. And it might be most expeditious in a podcast if I just say that's everybody in the Big Ten except for Minnesota and Rutgers and the four teams I'm about to name now that I see as being in the top tier, which means they could uh, contend for a Big Ten title and they would be expected to get um, nice seeds uh contend for top four seeds in the NCAA tournament. And I see that top tier is made up of Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan State, and Indiana. Mm. Interesting. What What is it about Indiana, uh, obviously after you know the last couple of seasons struggling, and maybe this is as simple as saying you get an elite talent like Romeo Langford, that vaults you up there, but what is it about Indiana's roster that gives you the confidence that they can be in that top group? Um, a couple things. One, uh, a best case scenario for Romeo Langford, and two, I, I feel like uh, there was uh, a lack of appreciation last year for very obvious and indeed legitimate reasons. When when you play a season like Indiana played last year, and you lose uh, by double digits your first game of the year at home to a Missouri Valley team, and then you're never uh, you know it, it, you never cross the threshold where you feel like you're seriously in contention for an NCAA bid, even though you can go back after the fact and say, well, you know they were they were 500 in the Big Ten. That's usually enough to put you in the discussion. But we just we just never had that tangible feel with Indiana last year. So it just felt like, well, it's, it's a new coach's first year. And that's that's all true. And that's all legitimate. But, you know, if we'd been looking for the good news, we would have said, my gosh, you know, Morgan just year to year went from a, a role player and afterthought to he was effectively in, in terms of the you know things that I look at as far as possession usage and, and percentage of shots. He was effectively this team's uh, featured scorer. And, you know, he made 63 percent of his twos um, as a Big Ten featured scorer. That is a really good thing. And it's very characteristic of us as college basketball fans and observers uh, to say, OK, now. Uh, he's got to develop an outside shot. <laughs> that's why he came back. And that's what he needs to do for Indiana to be otherworldly. And sure, I mean, don't get me wrong. That, that'd be a great help. But uh, don't look that gift horse in the mouth. He's he's a Big Ten featured scorer who made uh, 63% of his twos. And there's a ton of value just in that alone. And uh, he can 
this is where the divergence of outcomes comes in. I mean, I, I hope for the best for him as as a, as a player, and that he does develop his, you know, three point capability and gets drafted and all that. It's also the truth of the matter that he can help Indiana immeasurably as he is with one added increment of improvement in his last season. So that makes me you know, relatively bullish on, on the Indiana offense, despite what we saw last season. With Romeo Langford, obviously we've talked about him for years on this podcast and Indiana fans are very familiar with his a uh, storied career as a high school player in the state and the importance of, of him coming to the program. But from a production standpoint, when you look at a player who comes in with these accolades and you're trying to project what he's going to do as a freshman, how, how, um, how do you, how do you go about doing that? Because there's not really, right. uh, there's, I mean, he's got obviously a stats from the Adidas Scotland. He's got high school stats, but how do you project that onto a college roster uh, when you're dealing with a player of this talent? Right. Exactly the same divergence that we just you know described. The easy part is to you know look at this player and say that he is a lead pipe cinch uh, as a you know high 2019 draft pick. Uh, that that's the easy part. The tough part is to say what is he going to do uh, for Indiana in this one season that's only made up of you know like three dozen games. That's uh, that's a much tougher nut to crack. And specifically. Uh, what is he going to do in terms of three-point shooting? I mean, there's so much to love about him as a player, uh, his wingspan, you know, what he could add uh, defensively. Th- these are knowns. But, you know, the three-point shooting uh, wasn't necessarily always terribly consistent or accurate at, at the Adidas gauntlet. And, you know, it's tremendously <laughs> of high interest to IU fans. What is that three-point shooting going to be in 2018-19? Not that Langford is the only source on this roster for accurate outside shooting. I, I don't expect that he will be. But, again, as with Morgan, you know, it, it, it could sure help things if those threes go in. So, we don't know. Uh, I, I think I feel safe in saying, you know, he's he's got a lot of other skills to bring, even if that three point percentage isn't, you know, over 35. Uh, he's he's tremendously skilled at, at getting to the basket and uh, getting to the foul line. Uh, he's he's been uh, seen as high efficiency inside the arc, which is a great and not to be taken for granted uh, facet of a uh, high volume freshman guard. We don't always see that about the uh, highly rated uh, freshmen that, that come in and then play in the backcourt. So, you know, I think that the 50th percentile scenario for, for Langford is, is good enough to uh, bump the Indiana offense uh, up measurably, although never as dramatically as we always expect from highly rated freshmen. And uh, again, that's a, with all of the other uh, things that, we can talk about with the Indiana with this being Miller's second year. Um, you know, I, I don't want to uh, overstate the case when I say that Indiana's in the top tier. I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know, top 25 team in the hunt for a top four seed, but, you know, more likely maybe a five or a six. But, you know, I, I for one, if I'm an Indiana fan who uh, who missed the tournament entirely last year, uh, Morgan comes back. I, I land the, the huge uh, in-state prospect. I mean, yeah, I'll take all of the above. I mean, give me that. That, that sounds pretty good to me. Are there are there any other players on Indiana's roster that you maybe expect a big jump out of? You know, guys guys like Justin Smith have been talked about as a breakout. You know, Devontae Green, we've obviously seen his potential, but we don't know if he can be consistent. Beyond those two, Juwan and, and Romeo, is there anybody else that you're expecting a big jump from this year? Um, I am interested in seeing what Green can bring to the table. You know, uh, can again to go back to the morgan example i mean i feel like that was a a big leap last year that maybe uh wasn't talked about because of the overall year of indiana so can green uh be achieve that same kind of uh growth this year uh can evan fitzner fill the role the graduate transfers are supposed to fill where they're like they're fantastic <laughs> and you know maybe maybe he's the maybe he's the uh the unconscious uh three-point shooting threat uh the, those are the kinds of things that that i'm looking at uh, with interest with with indiana this season and you know, one of those stories always insinuates itself that you didn't even see coming. So, I mean, for good or bad. So that's 
yeah, again, I'm trying to uh, chart out the uh, most likely scenario with room for margin of error, good and bad on both sides. And the asterisk I would put on all of this is it's August. And, uh, you know, people will be uh, injured, not necessarily for Indiana, but for the competitors. Uh, people will be arrested or fired, not necessarily for Indiana, but for the competitors. And uh, a lot of these assumptions will change between now and the start of the season. But this is the way things are looking in August. You know, one of the things that happens every year, especially with, you know, guys going pro early after they have a really good season is that, you know, you see several of the Big Ten's top projected players going to be stepping into new roles. And, you know, sometimes we take it for granted that they'll just be able to continue the production that they had before. But, you know, they lose experienced, productive teammates. Now more of the focus is on them. And it's it's critical how they kind of respond to that pressure, you know, to, to determine how good their teams are. And this year in particular, I'm thinking about guys like Carson Edwards, Charles Matthews, Cassius Winston, you know, guys who really did well last year, but had a lot of talent around them. And now they kind of step up on the rung or, or even a few rungs in a guy like Edwards case. Who do you see out of that group or maybe even someone that I've kind of forgotten to mention that you think may struggle to adapt to their new role that we're all expecting big things from this year? Yeah, um, I I would not say uh, that Ed, Carson Edwards uh, has much of a, a jump to make. He was uh, he had a really heavy workload for Purdue last season, and so I I expect big things from him, and, and would be surprised to to see anything other than that. Um, you know, what about Ethan Happ? Uh, he's he's been around for a while. Uh, I feel like again. Uh, with him, we uh, operate under some kind of uh, perceptual parallax where we insist he must start making threes and, and lose sight of the fact that, you know, a guy who makes his twos and plays defense with his size is an effective uh, college difference maker as it is. So, uh, you know, these are good examples of, you know, we're, we we are rightly uh, fascinated with newcomers, but uh, returners can can make a difference too. And you know, with Michigan State, uh, I, I think you mentioned you know Winston. Uh, that is a that is a good example of somebody who really will probably see a bump up in workload. Although you, you never really know with Michigan State, it's it's always a surprise as far as minutes and workload. And I, I wouldn't uh, pretend to be able to forecast that accurately, but certainly on paper. Uh, Winston is is primed to take a, a big step up in workload, and maybe that maybe that does uh, take a hit from his efficiency, which formerly was very high. I always think back to poor uh, Nigel Hayes, you know, the year after uh, Wisconsin lost, you know, Kaminsky and, and Decker and all those guys, and uh, his his uh, performance uh, took a huge hit. I mean, he was he was uh, playing, you can say, heroically, and you can understand why it happened, but um, statistics. It, it can have an impact, and, and maybe we'll see that with with Winston. Although certainly Michigan State should have enough uh, horsepower to, to carry through there, but uh, we'll I, I do have the Spartans in the in the top tier, and uh, I, I think they'll they'll be able to carry on anyway. John, you mentioned that top tier earlier uh, with the four teams. Um, that middle tier, if you had to pick one team that from that middle tier that could potentially contend or, or have a chance to to really uh, surprise some people um, have a, a chance to win the league potentially if you had to pick one team from that second tier who would it be um, I would have to go with Purdue on the strength of Carson Edwards I know uh, that they've obviously lost a lot but uh, there was a there was a time period where I felt like the boilermakers uh, four or five years ago, uh, fell off the performance radar and now they've, they've righted the ship and, you know, with, I mean, Swan, you know, they lost Swanigan, uh, and they, they <laughs> arguably, uh, did, did fine or even better. So, um, you know, Matt Painter has earned some benefit of the doubt in terms of losing talent and still being able to, uh, perform in, in at least, uh, my laptop's evaluation, that doesn't mean Purdue uh, has the kind of Big Ten season that they had last year, but uh, you know that that would be a, a close. That would be an example of where I looked at it as a close case between this first and second tier business. Um, there's there's a lot to like in a, in a team that's that's led by Edwards and is uh, coming back after the kind of season Purdue had. 
So one last question for you here, John, to wrap up. I was intrigued uh, by a tweet that you sent out way back on August 1st, and you said you were looking at a bunch of individual player seasons from the past eight years uh, for some kind of, as you termed it, messy splash or slash speculative offseason research project. And you said that Victor Oladipo's 2013 was truly a season for the ages salute. Now, this is not going to surprise IU fans. That season is reflected upon a lot uh, by all of us. But I'm just wondering, in what context were you viewing uh, his season that made it stand out so much? Um, I decided to look at this, to me, vexed question of player development. Uh, I uh, became uh, fatigued with everybody talking about it and not trying to measure it, everybody very much, including me, because I never tried to measure it before. And so I was looking at year-to-year improvement and came across, you know, Oladipo's 2013 uh, for the ages. And that was just such an incredible season uh, and a lot, a lot of his uh, measurable improvement was on defense as well as offense. And that's the part that I think is easy. And a lot of us tend to forget. It was such a great season that I, I even played around with making uh, Oladipo's name, the name of my player development stat, you know, because there's a tradition where you use some player's name and you develop it into a, a backronym. And uh, I was trying to <laughs> figure out what that, what that would be. And I came up with observed level of adjusted development indexed to player outputs. Um, <laughs> that, that, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That spells Oladipo. That's how impressed I was by a season. Unfortunately, I have to tell you uh, that idea got left on the cutting room floor, <laughs> uh. but uh, that's, that's a, that's a podcast. That's an IU podcast uh, special. Um, you, you know that I, I considered it and thought about it and you'll never see it or hear from it again. I had to come up with a different name <laughs> that was less Indiana specific for uh, the entirety of college basketball, but that's how impressed I was. And, uh, I'll be rolling that out as part of our uh, big season preview staff uh, stuff at, at ESPN.com. Uh, this is what player development looks like to me. Well, I, I give you my guarantee that anytime we refer to it on this podcast, we will call it by its name, but then slip in AKA Oladipo, <laughs> who it was inspired by. <laughs> so that Sounds is good. great. That is great. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. We always appreciate you coming on. And uh, hopefully it is another fun, exciting, competitive Big Ten season, as always. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. And I look forward to talking about it with you guys. I always enjoy it. Absolutely. Thanks, John. John. I, I, I didn't think I could get any more excited about the season, but this this 30 <laughs> minutes with you, now, now I'm. I'm 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 going to rush out to the newsstands and I think and wait for the first magazines to get there. So thanks for the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I'm there with you. I'll, I'll see you there. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon, John. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. To get more from me and from Alex, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana University basketball. If you liked this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member who loves IU basketball as much as you do. You can also support the show by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, which helps us get the word out to more IU fans like yourself. We will be back next week with a new episode. Until then, as always, go Hoosiers.